Anti-discrimination law is caught between a rock and a hard place. In our society, in most societies, people believe that individuals should be judged on their merit. Personal qualities will obviously play a big part in this. However, judgment can quickly become deviant or can quickly become unfair when it is based on status, on group membership, or on a series of irrelevant characteristics. Enter anti-discrimination law and the fine line between judgment and unfair judgment. Now it gets even more complicated than this. Not every distinction is discriminatory. In fact, many distinctions are even legitimate. Take driving, for instance. Young people below a certain age are prohibited from driving. Well, this is a form of age discrimination. It is age discrimination, but we consider it a legitimate form of discrimination. We're trying to promote personal safety. Another complication is that many people will pride themselves on their group characteristics. These are the aspects of their identity that distinguish them from everyone else. The challenge from a legal perspective is crafting laws that prohibit unfair, invidious forms of discrimination from positive or legitimate ones. Now, it is not easy deciding which distinctions should be prohibited, and this will largely depend on social context. In the US, for instance, anti-discrimination legislation began with race. In Europe, it began with nationality. Historically, the EU has prohibited discrimination based on birth, based on gender, on political opinion, and on property. Over the years, as the social context of the EU changed, new categories were added, and now discrimination is prohibited based upon disability, civil partnership, age, religion, and belief. Identifying the grounds upon which discrimination is prohibited is only the first stage. Another question we might ask is how we go about determining whether this person is being discriminated against based upon those grounds. What I mean, does a person merely need to self-identify as belonging to that group? Or must they meet certain criteria? Do they have to look a certain way, behave a certain way, have been raised by certain parents, have come from a particular neighborhood? A third question we might consider are whether all grounds of discrimination should be treated equally. Is refusing to hire someone because they are obese, which does happen, the same as refusing to hire someone because they practice a particular religion, which also happens. The outcome is the same even if the grounds upon which the discrimination is taking place are different. What if both of these individuals the person who is obese and the person who practices a particular religion, applied for a position with the fire service. Is their exclusion from the position the same? Unfortunately, there does not appear to be a right answer to this question. The decision is mostly political. Which brings us to another issue. Who should be making the decision? Should it be the courts or should it be the legislature? The legislature, our elected representatives, seems to make sense as it provides their decision with a form of democratic legitimacy. However, since anti-discrimination legislation is usually designed to protect minority groups, this is necessary largely because of their political powerlessness, leaving their rights in the hands of the majority via their representatives is also a recipe for disaster as many discriminatory laws historically, including slavery, had received the assent of the legislature. Well, perhaps then the judiciary makes the most sense. We turn it over to the judges. But does a judge possess the competence to decide what is effectively a socio-political question rather than a legal one? Do they possess the legitimacy to make the decision? And will the state, will corporations, will the public comply? In reality, grounds are not decided by any single entity, nor based upon any single factor. It is rather a confluence of many. There are three main approaches in which protected grounds are settled. We begin with the first. Categories are fixed within the relevant instrument. 
whether it be a constitution, a statute, or a directive. Judges, in this instance, have little latitude. Fixed categories are problematic in their own right. By leaving it to the legislature, by leaving it to politicians, it is subject to political interests, it is subject to political whims. Whether or not a group is included will have much to do with the political pressure they exert on the political class that pushes them toward providing these protections. The judiciary will play a role in this model as groups who have been discriminated against or excluded from coverage within the legislation attempt to generate change at the political level and this is often done by pursuing inclusion at the legal level, meaning by filing lawsuits. Where an ethnic origin is protected, but not a religious one, which does happen, religious groups will make claims that they embody, they represent a particular ethnicity. Now, this was the case within EU anti-discrimination law. As EU law was motivated by the needs of a common market, anti-discrimination legislation was designed to support the creation of that market. What this meant, free movement of labor in support of the common market required a prohibition on discrimination against the nationals of other member states race or even religious discrimination was not considered in terms of the common market, only nationality and gender mattered. This raised a number of awkward questions about mobility and employment of darker skinned Europeans, but questions that went largely unanswered within the EU legal framework as race and religion were not legislated grounds of discrimination. A second approach involves legislating a broad principle of equality. All are equal before the law with no specificity in terms of grounds. The American Constitution is of this variety. In principle, any classification is open to challenge including affirmative action programs, including social welfare provisions, which distinguish some people from others. In practice, the second model largely empowers the judiciary by providing it with the ability to decide which classification it will examine and which it will not. The US Supreme Court has developed a double standard of scrutiny to help in this regard. First, when legislative classifications are rationally related to a legitimate state interest, the court will defer to the legislature. However, legislative classifications which interfere with the exercise of a fundamental right or disadvantage a particular group will face strict scrutiny from the court. Within the second standard, there must be no alternative to the imposition of the classification. The choice between rational and strict review will thus depend on the objective of the legislature, the impact of the law, and the availability or unavailability of alternatives. What we observe is that all levels of the analysis are in the hands of the judiciary. In practice, the only classifications that triggered strict scrutiny and were ultimately struck down by the Supreme Court have been race, ancestry, and alienage. Other classifications, age, gender, religion, have been dealt with via the lower standard of rational review, thus allowing for distinctions in the treatment of women, of young and old people, and people of faith. The American Supreme Court has been reluctant to extend strict scrutiny to other classifications as the outcome of strict scrutiny reviews is most always the invalidation of the statute. With rational review, judges maintain their authority over the offending legislation rather than the automatic invalidation that results from the stricter standard. The third approach is a combination of the first two. Provide a list of grounds. A list of grounds is specified, but also qualified as being non-exhaustive. This is the case for the European Convention of Human Rights, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Canadian Charter, 
and also the South African Constitution. Judges do have some discretion, but their discretion is qualified by the enumerated grounds. Article 14 of the European Convention of Human Rights identifies some grounds such as sex, race, color, or other status. Article 15 of the Canadian Charter is similar, declaring that every citizen should be protected from discrimination on all grounds, and in particular, without discrimination based on race, nationality, or ethnicity. One of the advantages to this approach is the flexibility it affords. The protection can be adjusted in light of present-day conditions. One of the disadvantages, however, is that expansion to non-enumerated grounds gives the impression that not all classifications are considered equal. The result, then, is the emergence of a hierarchy in classification with some forms of discrimination deemed worse than others. As there is discretion, the decision will ultimately rest with the judiciary, which will decide whether or not these categories qualify. A variety of factors have been considered by the courts when determining if a non-enumerated ground qualifies for protection. In Canada, the court looks to whether the group has suffered historical disadvantage, exists as a discrete and insular minority, and whether the distinction is based on immutable characteristics. The immutability criterion aligns with a meritocratic outlook as it suggests that people should be responsible for the characteristics they possess a choice over and not those they do not. This is appealing, but it's also quite dangerous. What about aspects of our identity that are a matter of personal choice? The immutability factor suggests that these do not deserve protection. Religion is a matter of personal choice, as is pregnancy, as is marriage, to a certain extent, nationality. Immutability has thus been qualified to include characteristics that are changeable, but only at an acceptable cost to personal identity. The second factor, exists as a discrete and insular minority, relates to the prominence of a group within the political process. The rationale is simple. One of the aims of equality law is to redress imbalances produced by majoritarian democracies. Even in democracies, or especially in democracies, marginalization can be reinforced by the hostility of the majority. The political process can thus be used to stoke prejudice and discrimination. There are, however, important limitations to the ineffectiveness argument. Courts have been unwilling to extend the discrete and insular minority criterion to homeless, despite their obvious ineffectiveness within the political process. The same is true of poverty, with courts refusing to recognize the poor as a discrete and insular minority, despite the absence of political power. This is particularly relevant when demographics result in poorer educational choices for indigent citizens. Poorer quality schools trap many already impoverished individuals in a cycle of disadvantage. This form of discrimination seems particularly invidious and even inhibits their political participation. Yet according to the courts in a variety of jurisdictions, this characteristic does not qualify or does not merit protection. What we learn from this is whether or not discrimination is based on an enumerated ground or an analogous ground. A relevant factor is the wider position of the complainants within the social framework. There are some discrete and insular minorities who enjoy the sympathy of society. There are other discrete and insular minorities who do not. This will ultimately influence how the courts rule on the matter. Of course, no single factor should be considered in isolation. Each one will ultimately impact the court's decision. This points to another flaw in the enumerated grounds approach. A desire to neatly place individuals into distinct classifications can produce a rather perverse and often inaccurate representation of the individual in question. Is an impoverished Sudanese woman repeatedly denied a promotion by her employer while other less qualified individuals surpassed her? Is the alleged discrimination a product of color, ethnicity, 
gender, or religion? What if she happens to be gay also? There are many instances of cumulative discrimination, but these are often dismissed as courts look to fit a person into a neat category or classification. This raises a final issue regarding anti-discrimination law. Who should be bound? Public or private actors? Again, this depends on circumstances. EU law, the European Convention on Human Rights, bind only the state. In principle, though have been extended to private actors through clever lawyering. For example, under the European Convention of Human Rights, states have an obligation to protect individuals from other individuals who breach their convention rights. In contrast, in the UK, focus has been on private actors, and only recently, via the Equality Act, have protections been expanded to include functions of the state. Then there is the European Court of Justice that, when applying the Equal Treatment Directive, has ruled that the equal treatment of men and women in employment relations binds the state, but does not extend to private employers. To conclude, anti-discrimination legislation is complex. We see a variety of layers. There are the grounds of discrimination. Those can be enumerated. Those can be left to the discretion of the judiciary. In both instances, there are strengths and weaknesses. There are also issues around the application of these classifications to individuals who may or may not fit the stereotype, the mold, the expectations that we have of people making claims based upon those classifications. This leads to an additional series of complexities as the courts come to grapple with the meaning of the legislation, the objectives of the legislature, the circumstances of the claimant, and the socio-political conditions in which the decision is being made. The point then, while anti-discrimination legislation is necessarily a legal issue, it behooves us to also consider the socio-political circumstances that influence the shape of that legislation and how that legislation is ultimately interpreted. Thank you.